Good afternoon to you. Welcome to Media Live here on TV3. My name is Alfred Okonse and News Live, my news up here at Tadesawe. Coming up in the headlines this afternoon. Cote d'Ivoire President al Hassan Ouattara begins today official visit to Ghana. Being the details of that Ghana marks World Food Day with a focus on investing in food and security and rural development. Also, Ghana International Bank, PLC, says there has never been any suggestion that the Asante was involved in money laundering. Also, we will tell you how a 13-year-old girl escaped from forced marriage to fulfill her educational dreams on the foreign fronts. This afternoon, former football star George Weir and Vice President Joseph Waikai head for a runoff in Liberia's presidential elections. We'll bring you these details on more coming up shortly here on Media Live. Just stay with us. Well, first story this afternoon, President of the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire, Hassan Ouattara, is in Ghana for a two-day official visit. The visit is to deepen further the already strong relations that exist between the two countries, as well as explore other areas of cooperation to their mutual benefit. This visit is a reciprocal one to the visit made to Cote d'Ivoire by the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nanadunakwe Kufuado. In May this year, at the start of his tour of the countries that within the West African sub-region, the two presidents and their respective teams are expected to hold bilateral discussions at the Flagstaff House Monday, 16th October 2017, after which the two leaders will address a joint press conference. Prior to President Waters' departure on Tuesday, October 17, 2017, the two countries will sign a bilateral agreement and inaugurate a joint commission for the implementation of the recent judgment passed by the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, Idlos. Okay, so let's still stay a bit further with this. And uh, we've been joined on Skype by Adam Bona. He's a security and international relations expert. Mr. Bona, good afternoon to you. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. We do know that the eight loss ruling is going to be one of the major issues that will dominate the discussion between these two heads of state. In your view, what should be the end result at the end of this bilateral talks on this eight loss ruling? Good, good afternoon, and uh, once again, good afternoon to your cherished viewers. Uh, just like you asked, I think when the day the ruling uh, was delivered, uh, I was in your studio, and some of us uh, raised the issue of having a bilateral diplomatic relations so that uh, we don't uh, end up becoming victimized by this uh, ruling. And some of us actually raised that there should be some form of agreement uh, where uh, both countries, we have always had that good relationship between ourselves and our neighbors in Cote d'Ivoire. And therefore, this uh, single ruling shouldn't mar the beautiful relationship. And so having uh, His Excellency Alassane Ouattara visiting Ghana uh, for, you know, this type of arrangement, I would say uh, it, it's called for. Uh, let's look forward to it and let's hope that uh, when this uh, ag agreement is somehow signed, uh, both countries would be at peace with each other. I'm saying this on authority of the fact that uh, the, just like the political climate in Ghana is usually supercharged, it is the same in Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, I think a few days after the days, I mean, the, the immediately after the ruling, uh, opposition parties in Cote d'Ivoire started raising hell that it was during Alassane Ouattara's uh, tenure that... Uh, part of uh, what belongs to Cote d'Ivoire uh, was ceded to Ghana. And therefore, I see this uh, visit as timely. Uh, and one of the reasons is that there are, you remember the former uh, president, uh, Bagbo, he, he's facing trial at the ICC. And so definitely he has his supporters. And there are other bad people who are on a high seas and might want to cause trouble. This visit is to let 
them know that uh, we are together despite the ruling and we wouldn't want a situation where uh, they do something in our name and say uh, Ghana has hit Cote d'Ivoire on the high seas or Cote d'Ivoire have hit us on the high seas. And so I think it is timely, Stephen. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, you, you talked about the advantages on both sides, but I'm, let's see. The, in your view, what should be the position of the two countries going into this bilateral uh, talks? Because in, in the end, it should be uh, a resolution that will satisfy the positions of the two countries in this situation. So what are some of the considerations you're looking at going into this bilateral agreement? I think... Uh, the, the considerations, let, let me be straightforward here. Uh, this agreement is just to make sure whatever uh, was delivered uh, during the ru ruling is properly implemented without any, uh, call it, uh, issues here and there from both countries. Remember, the ruling didn't tell us how uh, it should be implemented, you know, on the ground. And so this, re this agreement is now going to tell us we are going to probably spend the next 12 months and make sure, uh, you know, these boundaries are properly demarcated. This ABC, the, in terms of security and safety, these are the measures we are going to put in place. And these are the, the, the technocrats we are going to be putting uh, together to ensure that this ruling is properly implemented without necessarily affecting the way we have always lived uh, as neighbors. And so not much is going to change in terms of the actual uh, implementation of how do we call it uh, the ruling. The ruling has already been delivered. But what the ruling failed to do was to probably set a standard and say uh, this is how it should be done. And so I think as neighbors, our leaders, and I, I think it is courageous on both on the part of our leaders to come together uh, to tell us that, you know what, uh, despite the rulings, we are friends, we are neighbors, and therefore, let's make sure this ruling doesn't matter the relationship. And so, I think it's just basically the the two countries coming together and putting a team together. And this team is to reassure those of us, the ordinary persons in Ghana and the ordinary persons in Cote d'Ivoire, and also the international community, that you see, we are friends, you can come and invest in Ghana, you can come and invest in Cote d'Ivoire, and when you talk about investment, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, who are one of the strong countries in West Africa. And so it is to assure the outside world that you see we are not fighting and so they can come in. And so I think that it is significant, but not much uh, is going to change with regards to what the ruling actually said. The ruling still stands, but then it is the implementation. And usually if we are not very careful, the implementation would mar the beautiful relationship we have always had with Cote d'Ivoire. And so not much will change. Uh, yeah. Well, Mr. Bonan, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I'm grateful. Great. Uh, Adam Bona is a security and international relations expert, uh, also helping us with his thoughts on uh, the bilateral uh, relations between Ghana and Ivory Coast and also the meeting between Al House of the Water and President Ekofuado, which is all of the things we Nicole expected to take place uh, sometime soon. And we're keeping an eye on that and bring you a lot more development and subsequent bulletins concerning this particular meeting between the two. Uh, presidents. But away from that, the Ghana International Bank, PLC, says there has never been any suggestion that the Asante was involved in money laundering. The bank says it has no evidence to that effect. A statement issued on behalf of the management of the bank stated the bank has also not in any of its submissions questioned the integrity of the king. It noted the bank applied for an anonymity order in September of this year ahead of the tribunal proceedings in October which would have eliminated the mention of name of the king in the proceedings of the tribunal. The bank said it had maintained a long-standing relationship with the king and has also worked closely with him on initiatives such as the Otunfo Education Fund in providing IT education to children in deprived communities.
Yeah, let's still stay with the Ashanti region because there is an easy calm at the new plant bus terminal at the Safo terminal uh, here, and that's in Kumasi in the Ashanti region. Transport operators are protesting the decision by the STC to start operations within the new plant bus terminal. Ibrahim Abubakar is a correspondent in the Ashanti region and joins us with an update. Some transport operators here at the new plant bus terminal at Asafu Market are this morning protesting against the decision of STC to open a new station um, at this terminal. They are saying um, STC should continue operating at their Edum bus terminal. They wouldn't allow them to come here and disrupt their activities. As you can see, there is a heavy security um, presence here and they have blocked most of the roads to ensure that they wouldn't allow the STC buses to have access to the main road, even though, as you can see, the STC buses have loaded some of their passengers. We'll try and engage some of the um, demonstrators and find out what their main concerns are. So we've seen that you've blocked um, all the main entrances to the new plan terminal. What are your main concerns this morning? police <laughs> No more questions are 20 Ghana, no, you know, many problems. No, far, um, I had the name say, yeah, new plan, um, a bus terminal, ain't he? Obia, or Hunquaya, or Betima, Pebe, B, Kakrana, why any Juma, and my then a Muslim woman, I had a GP, I had to Omo, no, via STC, the Titian, Obian, Miss Omo, Omoya, the Ede, Omoya. I can only me traffic, say, I'll cook up to look at traffic to a crown of pass, I'll be able to a new minute. Well, <laughs> he's saying is that um, the STC owners are trying to cripple their business because they have reduced their fares from 40 cities to 20 cities. So they don't want them here. They can go back to their terminal and at a doom and take the 20 cities. Uh, this is a public um, bus terminal and everybody has the right to come. Yeah, yeah, but not all rights are permissive. You know, if you commit, you commit suicide. It's your right. But when it fails, you will be arrested. Why that? It's my right that I want to commit suicide. Why should they uh, arrest me? Not all right are permissive. Yo, yo, we have your place over there. It is a crime given to you. You are operating over there nicely. Why do you come here to come and spoil my daughter? We are almost one million people eating here. Taking our daily bread from here. Why that? We have your if you don't have a place, you have a place. Let me let me let me chip in something. We went to I the the original chief executive was there. He was giving out his program at the mansion in front of the Asantima Council. And as a for Henny spoke the Asafini said he, he has heard that there is a problem here. He don't want any problem over here. So he entreated uh, boss to let everyone go to his place and operate. Okay, thank you very much. From Kumasi, my name is Ibrahim Abubakar, TV3 News. Well, so that's the situation in the 
uh, Shanti region, that particular terminal. We're still monitoring the developments there, and we'll give you some more details as and when they come to us some updates. But today is World Food Day. As Ghana joins the rest of the world to mark this day, uh, the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana want government to promote organic farming, among other farmers, to restore uh, uh, the soil fertility instead of distributing chemical fertilizers, which many claim have adverse effects on the soil. Tetanati is a 65-year-old farmer practicing organic agriculture. Animal dropping some poultry and cattle on his farm give him the opportunity to transform this into organic fertilizers. We've come here for that the plants grew rapidly, flows and blooms well. But when unfortunately the rain stops, then you are in trouble. I mean, the, the plant starts scorching gradually. Unlike the organic fertilizer, that even when the rain stops somewhere, the eye will still uh, to survive. Organic fertilizers contain plant or animal based materials that are either a byproduct or end product of naturally occurring processes such as manures, leaves, and compost, or chemical fertilizers are manufactured artificially and contain minerals or synthetic chemicals. Despite having large tracts of land, decades of agricultural abuse has taken a toll on the soil in Ghana, depleting important nutrients and killing off bacteria and fungi that create organic material essential to plants. The perception these days is that if you don't add fertilizer to the soil before planting, you may end up with low yield. Organic or chemical fertilizers, which one is good for farmers here in Ghana to use? And is it true that chemical fertilizers have an effect on soil fertility? While well, farmers here at Abokobi want agricultural experts to come out with a clean cut policy and some research on the use of fertilizers in the country. So that in tomato growing area. Reverend Dr. Dria Jiman is a beneficiary of the Planting for Food program. He just started adding chemical fertilizers to increase the yield on his farm. It boosts the yield, but continued use of the chemical uh, fertilizer depletes the soil and make it the soil become acidic. People want good health, so they'll go for the uh, uh, organic produce. But here, uh, they wouldn't. They wouldn't bother you that this organic or this uh, inorganic, you see. So, what is the rationale for distributing chemical fertilizers? The soils that we have in our country or in all countries, once you continue cropping on it for a long period, the soil is depleted of organic material. So it's two things. How to get the organic material back into the soil is the question. So you can do that by getting organic matter. But the unavailability of organic material to put back to the soil, to rejuvenate it, for it to be able to support crop production. That is why now we go in for the inorganic fertilizer. So I asked if chemical fertilizers are indeed harmful to the soil. Some scientific evidence show the use of chemical inputs in our uh, production of food leads to some residues. These residues accumulate in the body and then cause troubles. The use of fertilizer, for example, on soils, um, there's leaching. Part of the fertilizer is not taken up by the crop. It gets into the water systems and it may get into our um, municipal uh, water systems. And if the treatment is not good, it ends up in our systems. So, organic or chemical fertilizers, what should be the way forward for Ghanaian farmers? It's a balancing act. I don't think there's anything wrong with um, combining them. Even with the scientific evidence that the inorganic um, causes problems, it is about the extent of use and how persistently it's used. Ghana government is a policy that we should try and see how to 
do organic farming because that is the best. But in the absence of getting the organic material to replenish the soil, you cannot stop farming. So quickly you have to put in inorganic material, that is the fertilizer. It is indeed a very uh, worrying situation and concern raised. Charles Nyaba is the Programs Officer of the Peasant Farm Association of Ghana. John me in the studio, Mr. Nyaba. Good afternoon to you. It's good to have you. Good afternoon. Now, listening to the conversation and, and watching what Portia Gabo put together there, it's a, it's a clear concern that if government is still giving you fertilizer, I mean chemical fertilizer, it's going to increase the acidic levels in the crops, yet we need to have more organic material in there. How do we ensure the balancing act so that we who are consuming, I'm yeah. speaking from the consumer's perspective, yeah. we go there and we are buying the, the fruit or the crops without knowing the acidic level. You do know about it. How do we ensure the, the balance between the two? Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, permit me to say good afternoon to farmers across the country. Uh, today is a very full day. And uh, I would like to thank all my colleague farmers for the efforts we are pushing to make food available for you and those in other areas who are not uh, producing. Um, in the first place, we need to increase our food production. According to AFO 2014 report, uh, for us to be, for Africa to be able to meet our increasing population, food production needs to increase by 104%. Because the 2017 World Population Report shows that our population is 7.7 .7 billion. And this figure will, do, will increase to 9.8 billion in 2050. Mm -hmm. That is, we are having 2.2 .2 billion more people to feed. to feed. In order to be able to meet that, we need to adapt uh, various strategies to be able to increase food production to meet this uh, uh, math that we have to feed. Now, whether we should stop using inorganic fertilizer or we combine the two is something that we all need to debate. You know, if you take organic fertilizer or organic manure, when you deposit it on the farm, it takes a longer time for it to decompose and the plants will make use of the nutrients within that. Mm -hmm. But when you take the inorganic manure, that's a chemical fertilizer, that one is able to dissolve first, and then the, the, the plants will make use of that. Mm -hmm. So continue using the inorganic fertilizer will lead to lynching and over application can also, some of the chemical components can find themselves into the food that we eat and cause a whole lot of problems. Which is, which is dangerous. So, I so mean, in, the, in the short okay. run, what we are calling right. for is the combination of the two. So that in the long run, if you get a good soil structure, we can reduce one and then we continue. And continue with the yeah. other. But, but as we, we celebrate today being a World Food Day, would you say Ghana is, is secured or we've taken strides to be secured when it comes to food production? Yeah, we've made some progress, but I think we haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. If you look, if you take a Ministry of Food report that they've just released, mm -hmm. we have 1.2 million people who are still hungry. They don't get... 1.2 mi million? Yes. And out of this figure, you have 34% coming from Upper West, and 15% uh, coming from Upper East, 10% from Northern Region, 11% from a Brown Half, 11% from Asante Region. So this figure tells us that we need to really do more. Now, when you look at this figure, majority of the poor are coming from the rural area. Now, the problem, or my fear, is that consistently, we continue to have the youth living the agriculture sector. Average age of yes, a farmer because today. Because I was, I was doing a research, and yeah. then um, from what I see, the, 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 the average age of a farmer in Ghana is about 56 yeah. so, years so, and above. Yeah, and that is a source of worry because this age continues to increase. Because the youth who we are have coming, more older people now, getting into farming. Yeah, being in farm because they are there, they are not going out. Mm -hmm. The youth who are supposed to come and replace them are not interested in farming. Why is that the case? We, we have done some small survey mm -hmm. and realized that. A graduate from a farm family will always not go back to farming because of our educational system. Because when you look at most of our tertiary institutions, we don't really train people and encourage them to go back to agriculture. We did a small visit in a Ashama to just speak to our farmers. I met an old lady who said, yes, I've received seeds, I've received fertilizer from the government, 
but I cannot till the soil. And my son will not agree to come and hold the hoe and till the soil for me because there are no power tillers to help us do that. So we are thinking that if we actually want to sustain the agriculture sector, we need to put in measures that these people who complete universities and other places will be interested in going back. But is it, is it not very ironic and worrying that you're training agricultural students at the various tertiary levels and they graduate yeah. with, with degrees in agriculture and farming and they don't want to actually practicalize what they learned in school. For you, where you sit, yeah. what is the problem? I mean, I mean, if I've learned how to farm yeah. and I don't want to apply it, there should be a problem somewhere. Yeah, there is. Uh, to me, I first of all have problem with the approach of teaching agriculture in our various schools. I think we need to take people from the onset. When we were coming up during our, our time, the syllabus, we have agriculture science as a course at the JSS level. You go to SS, you have agriculture science as a core subject. Today you go there, we don't have agriculture science. It's only those who want to specialize in agriculture who do agriculture. Now, even those people, in most of the schools that we have, we don't have demonstration fields where you take these people there. True. So they just go there to read books. Now, if they even go, they continue like that to agri training colleges or they go to the university and do agriculture, you don't expect them to go back to take hoe and catalysis again. Why? Because it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't pay. Because how much can you use hoe and catalysis to cultivate? How much land can you do? So we expect that we should be able to improve feeder roads, improve agro-industry, bring in some smaller innovations that farmers can make use of. Let, let, let me production. find out your assessment of the various interventions made by governments gone by and present. We had the um, National Service uh, Secretariat also encouraging or creating a module to have national service persons have national service farms. Yeah. That was a bit to get the young people, the youth involved in yeah. agri. There's this planting for food and jobs program which is enrolling a lot of young people. In your assessment, how will that solve the problem of young people not wanting yeah, to get into I think agri? for planting for food and jobs program is a fantastic program because you provide farmers with inputs and they will defer payment to okay. pay after harvesting. But I think there are several things that we need to do. The issue of national service engaging them in agriculture is good, but I think that it should be demand driven. Okay. We need to do cost benefit analysis to see how much cost do we put in in getting the support to do their farms and how much do we get back. Right. But if we are able to put in measures that these people will be able to take their own credits and inputs and establish their own farm so that when the service period is even over, they can continue with that area. But if you go to most of the farms and do analysis, you realize that the cost that we incur to create these national service farms might even end up being higher than what we are getting. Well, one of the things you have to grapple with this year was the army worms uh, situation. Is it still the same? Just give me a picture of it. Are we really winning the war? Yeah, or? you know, the, this farming season is almost over. Mm -hmm. So now army worms are no more a threat because they are always threat when they maize are still at the right. tender age but when they grow and then it's getting to the harvesting stage it's no more a threat our problem will be the subsequent years what will happen right. so we need to prepare ourselves so that when they come because all the infested farms are now breeding grounds for these army worms so they are waiting when the rains come and then you start planting then they come up so Nyawa, thank you thank very you much too. i'm grateful yeah. and a happy food well food day. food day to you thank you <laughs> Charles Nyawa is a uh, secretary of the uh, peasant farmers association of ghana uh talking about the world food day today and uh, let's still stay with the issues related to human development because most teenage girls in most communities in the northern region are pressured into marriage Eva Tiboka reports on how a 13-year-old girl escaped from forced marriage to fulfill her educational dream. We give her a different name for fear of stigmatization. Zuera was forced into marriage at age 13. We were 12 children in number and we could not take care of them. So for her father, marriage was the only solution. The man uh, promised the father that he will roof two rooms for him, and he also wanted to sleep in a zinc room. That is where the whole thing started. 
She reflects on her marriage day. They told me I was getting married. I was very sad. I, I didn't even know how to cry. I was just sitting down and tears was running down. Junior high school would have been her educational cup. But determined to secure a brighter future through education, she managed to escape from the marriage. They sent me there and they locked me up for three days. And the fourth day, I was happy with them. And I did, I think, I accepted it. And I was praying to God, God should make a way. This is not where I wish to be. That day, they all slept off. I just came out of the house and I saw their bicycles standing and I picked one of them. The journey to freedom was dreadful. I ran to the bush cave in order to get to work. And when they got up and they realized I was not there, they were chasing me. When he got to me, he came across me and I fell down and then he started dragging me back. With all hopes gone, Memuna Sando and Nami Yile Rana stood firm for Zuera. Everybody was just talking nonsense. It was the chief that stood up. So they went and brought Gloria things. I said that if they don't release Gloria to me, I'm coming with police. As a parent, an educationist, I don't think I should put my girl in school, supporting the girl to go to school, and at the end of the day, I don't get good results about my, my daughter, I will take it. A child development non-governmental organization, Comfort, assisted Zuera to achieve her dream. Zuera has completed senior high school, waiting to get into the midwifery school. Statistics show child marriage is most prevalent in the West Mampusi and Yagba Muaduri districts. Isodek has been proactive, rescuing most girls from forced marriages and sending them back to school. The girl child was born into these areas of cultural practices that do not see education to be the main target that can improve upon their life. So we targeted one that the low numbers of girl child education in schools should be increased. They want government to turn its attention to forced marriages in rural communities in particular. Some good news there, but small news on midday life. Do stay with back shortly. And in business news this afternoon, Ghana Gas Company has denied reports gas from their field is faulty and largely to blame for the atomic junction gas explosion. The company says it has always complied with strict standards and safety measures put in place by the Ghana Standards Authority. The company has also come under fire from drivers and LPG tankers who say gas from the Atobo field is to blame for the explosion. Ben Kedi Asante is the chief executive officer of the Ghana Gas Company. My colleague Komla Kloche yeah. is uh, with him at the moment, uh, bringing us some more details, uh, response from the Ghana Gas Company. Komla, you can take it over. So we need to put a stop to this. And I think you are all our partners. We have to make sure that the right information is disseminated. We cannot afford to have half truths out there. You think like, oh, maybe this is what happened. I know this or not. No. You know, some of us just know enough to be dangerous in terms of the reporting or in terms of the handling of the information. We have to make sure that we get the right message to those that need to hear. And so we can get the most appropriate safety protocol in place. If we back at the wrong tree, I think it's not helpful to anyone. I want to talk also about. Um, uh, you, you would notice that, for instance, if uh, the, 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 the tanker guys also held a press conference today, mm -hmm. you, you, they, they, maybe not directly, but then to suggest that the fault is coming from Ghana. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, because in your statements, you are trying to tell us that the areas that we should be looking at is not the source of the gas. But then you're also talking about along the value chain. And, and it's all pointing to the things. That we, so even though we are saying no blame game, certainly we are doing blame game. That, that, is, that, is, just, that is just my observation. Okay. Okay, so my, my, my question is this. You, you, you did point out that uh, it's not about where you cite the, the gas station or 
feeling station of what part uh, uh, I mean the the kind of safety measures and things that you need to put in place. But but I but I from my understanding I thought gas stations are supposed to be sighted a certain distance away from from residential areas and things like that. I want I want you to speak to that. And then you also said that gas is uh, sorry, air it, no gas is rather heavier than air. So so when 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 there is a, a I'd like your tell uh, fug fugitive emission. In other words, the gas has escaped. Yes. Okay. When that happens, we thought then the gas would go down and then be. But, but some of the explosions happened. We realized that it's as if the gas was. What happened at Trade Fair, for instance? The, it was supposed to have gone to pick fire from inside the Trade Fair and then blasted back. So if it is supposed to go down, how then does it fly over a wall and go. You know, yes, that's right. Reason. You know, I, I hope they say the right thing. I am talking really um, currently not so much as a CEO of Ghana Gas, but as a practitioner in the industry and what I've seen over the 29 years of my career. Now, I will tell you that each time we do a root cause analysis, we go across the entire value chain. Okay. Now, this particular case, it was obvious, and I'm talking about the atomic one, it was obvious that it occurred at a station. We're not going to do any guesswork there. Now, the root cause then will be, okay, what made that explosion occur? You can look at the quality of the gas and say that, well, maybe it's this. Then you have to think again, is this the only thing, the only incident of gas that has happened at stations, that is not from Atuabo? No, it's not. There have been other sources that have resulted in that as well. So even from, from, from that uh, um, approach, you would note that maybe we have to look closely at how we discharge or how we load the LPGs onto these tankers. We have to do this. We, we, have, we are not here. Um, to try to say, oh yeah, John did this or Peter did that. It is important as citizens that we know how to stop this and we look at where we can stop it. Now, LPG siting, it's, it's always safe. Even for pipeline gas, that is buried one meter deep under us. We try As a CEO of Ghana Gas, addressing a press conference on the earlier reports of people blaming the company for the explosion last week at Atomic Junction. Still have your midday life. We'll be back with some sports news. And if you are a Diana Star supporter, you should be happy by now. We'll be back shortly to stay. Right, good afternoon, this is still Midday Live here on TV3. My name is Yao Fusulabin. It's time now to get into our sports stories. But let's start off with the biggest news in Ghana football, where Indiana Stars are Ghana Premier League champions for the second time in eight years with a game to spare after a 2-1 victory over Elmina Sharks in Doma. Sam Adam's late penalty was the defining goal for Indiana after Rashid al Hassan had cancelled out Benjamin Trinibua's opener for the visitors who needed a win to be certain of their tough flight status. The result in Doma was enough to give Ediana a second league title in eight years, but that plus Waffer's 1-2 loss in Cape Coast uh, against the Ebusuad Dwarfs uh, means they have a seven-point advantage going into the final round of league games. Ediana won their first league title the same season. They joined the Ghana Premier League in the 2009-2010 season, and this season they had to endure a long battle with Waffer for the right to be called champions. In the end, it was determined by the experience of the new champions. While still staying with the Doma club, Adriana CEO Albert Kome has praised his side on clinching the title after a tough season. Adriana won yesterday against the Omina Sharks to win the title for the second time in eight years to the joy of the fans in Doma. Albert Kome spoke exclusively to TV3. Well, um, we feel good. Uh, it's normal. With the uh, us because uh, for the last we've been trying to 
unless the trophy, though we stayed be, uh, between third and the first. But uh, this year, God being so good, uh, we've been able to cleanse the ultimate. They defy the rings, and then um, you could see from all the corners and then the bars that they were all full. Um, for me, I was very tired and exhausted, so I came back home. But I realized the pictures I'm seeing in the social media uh, tells you that, as usual, when they win a game, they don't sleep to the next day. It's been very good messages from within uh, tells you that people are very happy. Also, that's the Diana Stars uh, CEO there, Albert Comey. But away from that, Ghana maintained its 52nd position on the FIFA ranking released on Monday, despite avoiding defeat in high-profile matches this month. The Black Stars drew 0-0 with Uganda in Kampala in the penultimate 2018 FIFA World Cup qualifier, but recharged and thumped Saudi Arabia 3-0 in Jeddah in an international friendly. Ghana now eighth in Africa, uh, behind some of Africa's informed sides. Tunisia are the highest ranked nation on the continent after moving three places up the world ranking. Egypt as, are in second place after beating Congo 2-1 at home to seal a 2018 FIFA World Cup qualifying spot, the first time since 1990. Well, on to our last story now, and Colin Kaepernick has filed a lawsuit against the NFL team owners uh, he believes are conspiring not to hire him because of his protest against racial injustice. Kaepernick has been without a team since he opted out of his contract uh, with the San Francisco in March. He first protested by sitting during the national anthem in August 2016 before opting to kneel instead. Other players followed suit and criticism from President Donald Trump this September saw the protest spread. Well, that's all the sports here on Midday Live. My name is Yao Ofosula. There's more sports later on News 360. But up next is Entertainment News with Alfredo Kansi. And as same as afternoon, although all six remaining contestants in this year's Ghana's Most Beautiful continue to exhibit intelligence on stage, some have distinguished themselves with outstanding performance in Central Region's Baba consistently. And delivering has not swayed as she dazzled once again in last night's episode. That Joan Mofose has filed this report. I think there was 71% of Ghanaians who agree states. And when I'm saying this, I, as including the charismatic, the orthodox churches, Protestants, and those other Christian uh, religions as well. Baba had a big sweep in Sunday's episode as she grabbed three out of four awards for the night after a stunning performance. The awards were most disciplined in the reality house, best costume, and overall star performer for the night. Sewa's poise on delivery also earned her most eloquent performer for the night. Let me ask you, uh, Alfred, uh, how many women have you invited on this show since January? The show, which took a different dimension, allowed all six contestants to co-perform with presenters within the media general fraternity. Posing as guests on different programs, the contestants talked about how the media contributes to the progress of the country with regards to issues of politics, religion and censorship. Of three adults keep their social media password secret from their partners. Really? and 16% of couples link Facebook use to jealousy. While some of the contestants were on top of their game, others could not make an impression on the judges. Some of them could not contain the excitement after their performance. I realized I'm a fast talker, so I've been trying to work on it. And it seems like I'm getting positive feedback. So I'm very grateful. I was very relaxed. And it was more like I was having a conversation with her. Yes, and that's, I'm sure that's how come I got such a wonderful comments from the judges. So today's section was quite fun and different because all the time we always tend to present and do all sorts of things. But today's interview was to have a chat with presenters. 
After staging the performances together with the contestants, some of the presenters said the show was on a different pedestal. GMB 2017, it's been progress upon progress, and every day is an improvement upon the other. If you witness, then been looking um, back from when they started, and if you listen to the comments that came today after the deliveries, you realize that it's been improvement upon improvement, and so sure, they are really learning very well, and then they are actually keeping to the task. The ladies are really performing, exhibiting the talent they have within them, and that is one whole mark about Ghana's most beautiful. I mean, the ladies are really well coached and you understand what they do. So when you sit back by your TV set watching them, you realize that this is indeed the pageant that you have to watch. The show gets even more competitive as six contestants remain in the battle for the crown. Ghana's most beautiful 2017 straight out of Ghana. <laughs> That's it for the news this afternoon here on TV3 Media Live. On behalf of the rest of the team, we're grateful. Make time as always of the news in brief and also our major news bulletins on TV3. My name is Alfred Akanji. Have a good afternoon.